Who doesn't like cars that are fast and furious? But is there a way to put some muscle into your retirement the same way you put some muscle into those cars? We're going to be talking about that on this week's edition of the State of Greater West New York Report, which, as always, is brought to you by... Each week, our community makes history. Each week, you make history. And each week, there's only one source to turn to for the first take on history. You know what that is? Subscribe to the Sentinel right now to discover the history being made in your own backyard. The Menden Honeyoy Falls Lima Sentinel. More than just your news, it's your history. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Hi there, and welcome again to this week's edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. I'm Chris Carosa, and this week we're going to be talking about something that really embraces us all, and that's retirement. Eventually, at least we hope to, have a happy and comfortable retirement, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Now, this, to some extent, is going to start off for beginners, but then we're going to get into some advanced stuff in the second half of the show. So let's start off right off the bat and see what we've got here this week in the State of Western, Western New York report. So let's go here, and what do we got? What do we see? We see the name of the book. Hey, what's my number? Which might be familiar to many of you out there. It's a book that really describes what this process is and even gets to that advanced stuff at the end. What we really wanna talk about today, though, is sort of more or less a metaphor, a metaphor for retirement based on what we all like. We all like those muscle cars. And in a sense, retirement, at least in the basic part of it, it can be kind of, be kind of looked at as four on the floor, including reverse. Now that's a little tricky. We'll get to that in a second. But what do we actually mean by four on the floor, where here's a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna be talking about. First gear really is the retirement saver's secret weapon. That's the power of pre-tax savings. Now, when I say pre-tax, there's, there's actually an alternative that is after tax. We'll talk about that too. But this will initially start off with pre-tax because that's what most people really are used to. Second gear, is really putting your retirement savings on cruise control. And that's the power of this pre-tax compounding. Third gear is really turbocharging your retirement savings. And if you're lucky enough to work for a company that matches your contributions, that's what this is about. Fourth gear is putting your retirement savings at the highest gear. And this is the power of the risk return relationship. This now gets into the intermediate level of what you're gonna to need to know in terms of retirement. We will talk about reverse because anybody who's driven a standard knows that reverse is always an option. And it, it, it's going in the opposite direction or in, your, in the case of retirement, maybe the wrong direction. So we're gonna talk about maybe how to overcome leakage when it can't be avoided. Leakage is a technical term that industry professionals use when you take money out of your 401k plan prematurely. Then finally, we're going to get into this advanced thing called retirement readiness. Well, let's let's go right into this and see where we start. So what is this first gear, this pre-tax savings, and why is it advantageous to you? Well, I'm going to throw up some numbers here. Don't be too intimidated. They're really just meant to show you the concept of what we're talking about. And they look like this. If you are saving 5% of your income, this assumes that you earn $25,000 a year. So it's really more for entry-level people, people who are just starting off in the workforce. And I'm gonna compare 5%, 8%, and 10%. Those are deferrals. That's how much you're contributing based on your salary each year. And what it is, is it, it reduces your pay. At 5%, your pay is reduced by a little over $40. 
at 8%, it's reduced by $65. And at 10%, at it's reduced by $81. And this is assuming that you're getting a paycheck every two weeks. Now, your annual tax savings, though, ranges from $188 at 5% to $300 at 8% to $376 at 10%. At a 15% annual contribution rate, your tax savings will be $563. At a 20% annual contribution rate, which is really what most people suggest you aim for, your tax savings annually will be $750. So this is money that you're saving right off the bat. Not only are you saving for retirement and you'll, you'll reap the advantages of that, but you're actually paying less in taxes. Now, most people would consider that a good thing, but like I said, there is an alternative as we go into second gear. Second gear really talks about pre-tax compounding. Now here you're gonna see the difference between saving for at a pre-tax level, which is what most people do, and saving at an after-tax level, which more and more younger people are doing because 401k plans now offer, offer a Roth option. So you can see the difference here just in the growth of the tax deferred account versus the taxable account over the years, over 30 years, it's $211,000 on a tax deferred account versus $148,000 on a taxable account, an after tax account, like a Roth IRA. Now, you might be ask, asking yourself, why would I ever do a after tax savings account? Because look at the difference in the money over time, how much it grows. Well, here's the thing when you take money out of a tax deferred account, you will be paying taxes on that money. You cannot escape taxes. You won't be paying taxes on a Roth account. So that $148,000 that you see is the money that you can actually live on in retirement. That $211,000 at the top of the chart there at 30 years, you take that out, you're going to be paying taxes on it. And theoretically, it's going to end up being something very similar unless you're in a lower tax bracket when you retire. So that's really the key thing. If you are currently in a tax bracket that you will believe will be lower than the tax bracket that you'll be when you retire, then you want to save it in an after-tax account, in a Roth account. If you're older now and you're in a much higher tax bracket, then maybe uh, when you retire, that tax bracket will be lower. Therefore, you'll want to save it in an after-tax or in a pre-tax account. So what I'm saying is that there's not one set it and forget it sort of solution in terms of which side of the tax ledger you put these savings in. It really depends on your circumstances, where you're working, what your current salary is, what your current tax bracket is, and how that might compare in retirement. The bottom line is by the time you retire, you'll probably have some, some money that is saved in an after-tax account. A Roth IRA and some money that's saved in a pre tax IRA account, a more traditional contributory IRA. And when I say IRA, I, these can also be 401k plans that you then roll over in an IRA after you retire. So that, this, that's an important distinction to make. It's again, there's not going to be necessarily a right or wrong answer because you are guessing at what point or what level that tax will be there. A lot of people can't even predict what they're going to be making or, or need when they retire. So forget about the tax thing. So third gear. Third gear is this thing that really, hopefully, you, you're in a position to benefit from. And that's the company match. If you look at this chart here, you'll see the difference of how you grow with a company match versus without a company match. The lighter blue line is much larger than the darker blue line. The lighter blue line is the one with the company and the other one is out. So you want to be able to contribute at least enough money to get the full company match in your retirement. Now, the last thing that people think of, and maybe less and less now with target date funds and default options, but there is still this sense of investment growth. 
that's fourth gear. That's where you really want to ramp things up and uh, kind of go in, a, go in this, uh, put the nitrous, I guess, in the engine as you speed along towards retirement. And here you want to really distinguish between stocks, bonds, and cash, really at the easiest level. There are potentially alternative investments, but let's just stick to stocks, bonds, and cash. And what you can see, this is over an extended period of time from uh, in, during the post-World War II. Period. We didn't want to go into the Depression in World War II because that really kind of made things go weird in terms of markets. But since then, in the post-World War II era, we've had a fairly stable returns in all asset classes. And what you see in the stock asset class, it's, it's the highest returning class, whether it's before inflation, after inflation, or after inflation in taxes, you can see it's much higher than what you're seeing in the other two asset classes. And note, note cash. If you look at the most extreme right-hand column there, cash is actually negative after inflations and after taxes. So when you take into account inflation and taxes, you lose money if you keep it in cash. That's over this period of time. Now, speaking of losing money, what happens if you go into reverse? What happens if you take out money from your 401k account prematurely? Now, you sort of you could do this with your IRAs, and definitely if you have Roths, you're allowed to take some of the money out. But let's focus primarily on the 401k, because with the 401k, you could actually take out a loan, which is better than taking out a hardship withdrawal, taking out a secure out. Because a loan means that you're going to pay it back, and that means you won't necessarily lose if you take out money. So this is what it's this is what this reverse gear is about. It's about overcoming this leakage from your retirement account. How do you do that? Well, loans have to be repaid at a rate equivalent to your current goal-oriented target. Remember that term, goal-oriented target, because we're going to be talking a little bit more about that in the advanced stages, but you can really not be hurt by taking out a loan in your 401k plan if you abide by this rule, paying it back with an interest rate equivalent to your goal-oriented target, at least, at least your goal-oriented target. Could be more. Now, a lot of people really think of 401k plans and they say, oh, it's all about investments. Well, let me tell you, let me bust a little myth for you. It's not really all about investments. There really are three critical components. And, well, there's four things that are involved in what money you end up with when you retire. Investment return, when you start contributing, how much you contribute, and then your retirement date. All those components are part of this formula, which yields whatever it is that you have when you retire. Guess which one of these you cannot control? I'm going to make it. You can't control the investment. Everything else is up to you, but you really can't control the investment. You say, well, yeah, I could by investing in the right things. Well, yeah, sure, that you can help yourself by investing in the right things, but it doesn't necessarily mean you can control what the return is. So you want to focus on the three things that you can control. And here's an example. Let's say that uh, we compare the typical asset allocation. That means what's the percentage of stocks, bonds, and cash most 401 savers hold with the optimal asset allocation. So the optimal one gives you the best return. The typical one really lags behind. So most people do not have the optimal asset allocation. They're actually investing, I won't say poorly, let's just say suboptimally. Now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. How much longer will you have to work to make up for this loss of return? Well, studies show you only need to work four more months. So you could make up this, this investment shortfall as you go along. Now, I'm going to tell you a, a, another thing about starting early and going later. So let's look at three or two different people, early Earl and late Larry. Early Earl invests $1,000 a year for 19 years in, uh, I'm sorry, for 16 years, beginning at age 
well, I think it's 20 minutes. If you read it over here, let's just click here. It's uh, actually age 15. So it's $1,000 a year. So you start with your teenage summer job and you put $1,000 a year into a retirement plan. It could be an IRA at this point. And you do that until you reach age 30. So just about 15 years. That's early Earl. Now, late Larry, he starts at age 40 and puts in $5,000 a year until age 55. So it's also 15. The total amount of investments, okay, it's a total of 16. The total amount of investments is $16,000 for early Earl and $80,000 for late Larry. Now, what's the difference? How much will they have when they retire? Let's take a look at that magic graph here. Well, here we go. Early Earl definitely has more than late Larry. How much more? Well, late Larry ends up with just a little over a half a million dollars. Early Earl, though, remember early Earl was putting a lot less. He ends up with more, more than $700,000. That's a big difference. And, and note that early Earl only put in $16,000. Late Larry invested or contributed $80,000 and yet ended up with a lot less. So here's an example of what the advantage is when you to investing early. Now, if we really want to take the extreme case here, let's add TurboTax. And it, just to remind you that early Earl and late Larry earned $711,000 and $519,000 respectively. The TurboTax really just put money in from the day that the tot was born up until their Eight, uh, sorry, their 18th birthday, and that was a total of again, it's gonna you're gonna add one more year there, so it's gonna be 19,000 euro. What does that turbo tot end up with? You're not gonna 2.2 million dollars, and that's really all this is using assuming an annualized growth rate of eight percent. And you saw from before that, that that's a about two percent less than what you typically saw in the stock market. So this is covered, uh, by the way, the, these child IRAs concepts, which is what this TurboTot is. Really, we cover that in the book from cradle to retirement and from uh, how to parent's guide to turning your teen into a millionaire. Both of those books are available wherever you buy fine books, including Amazon. We're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, we're going to get into the more advanced part of how to turbocharge or, or put muscle into your retirement when we come back on the State of Greater Wisdom.
Welcome back. You're watching the State of Greater Western Europe Report. I'm Chris Grossa, and we're, we're talking about putting some drive into your retirement plans. And the first part, we really focus on things for the beginners. This part, we're going to be talking about more advanced functions. When you're well onto your career, what are some of the things that you want to do to kind of refine and make sure that you're on the right course? Before that, we did have a couple of questions that I wanted to get to. And that was, what do people actually do if they want to catch up uh, to, if you're the, if you're late Larry or early Earl, how do you catch up? With them? Let's, let's start off with late Larry. So late Larry does have some reprieve. He can catch up to the, uh, to early Earl just by adding more money into his account, saving more over that same time period. So it's a little over, it's about six and a half thousand dollars more a year, and he'll catch up to early Earl. If he wants to catch up to the Turbo Tot, he's going to have to put in over twenty thousand dollars a year. Now you could do that in a four hundred one k plan. You could do that. So that means that starting at age forty, if you've got a good job with a good salary, you could defer up to twenty thousand dollars, or really more than that, a year, and that'll put you at over two million when you retire. Now, what, what about the case, uh, case where there's a, a last desperate attempt to match TurboTot? Let's say you can't put more money in. Well, you could work later if you want to do that. So if you want to catch up to TurboTot in your, uh, remember, this is what TurboTot had at age 70 when TurboTot was. Well, early Earl has the same amount, roughly the same amount of money at age 85. So he could work till age 85. Yeah, like that. You think it's bad there? Look at what uh, late Larry has to do. He has to work till age 89. So, yeah, there are ways to catch up, but uh, you you don't want to really have to work well into your retirement before then, otherwise it's not worth retiring. So let's let's get right to the advanced thing, and that's the retirement readiness calendar calculator. What this does is it helps you discover your goal-oriented target. What's a goal-oriented target? Well, a lot of people say that you know you have to meet your investment return needs or you have to identify what your investment return is which is true that's really what this goal oriented target is but unfortunately the industry doesn't really talk too much about that when they talk about risk they talk about something called volatility volatility just means the variance of returns how they differ from year to year and the more volatility the more spread out the returns are over time, the more risk you have. So let's look at an example here. Let's say that you're going over to England, jolly old England, and you are in a pub and you want to impress people there. So you, you decided you're going to play a game of darts. Well, it turns out that you can't play by yourself. You have to pick a partner and you don't know anybody in the pub that could be your partner. So you pick two guys at random and you say, hey, can you, uh, let me see how you can throw the darts and I'll decide from there what, whether or not you're going to be my partner. So player A, you give him three dots and darts and player B, you give him three darts and you each let him throw. So they each take a turn at throwing, they throw the three dots and this is kind of their spread. So you look at that and which player are you going to pick? Well, it, it looks like it makes sense to put, pick player B because he's got a very tight grouping. Not a lot of quote unquote volatility in his throws. He's always throwing in the same place. Whereas look at player A. He's all over the board. His throws are all over. He's not very consistent at all. Well, you know what? There's something missing from this. And it's pretty important. And that's the target. If you look at this, player A actually hit the target. He's all over the place, but that allowed him to hit the target. Player B consistently missed the target. So you're going to end up picking player A. That's why volatility is a little misleading to use that as risk. Now, what's a real definition of risk? Well, the real definition of risk is missing your goal. Think of it as, well, you're walking. Your goal is to walk. If you trip, you miss your goal. Well, what's the risk? Well, you might twist your ankle or scrape your knee. That's what happens if you trip when you're walking. But there's more to it than just tripping 
and walk. It's where you're walking. Let's say that you are walking on a couple of stools and you trip. Well, you know, now the risk is, is a lot more because you could break your leg, you know, falling from this height. And if you really want to get an extreme, let's say you're walking on a ledge and you trip. Well, the risk is, well, we don't want to get into that risk. So it's important to know where, what your situation is to determine what your real risk level is. And that risk occurs when you miss your goal. So what is your goal-oriented target? How do we calculate that? Well, the way we do that is we look at these numbers here. They're pretty no easy numbers to get. It's your current salary, the current value of your retirement savings, your current annual contribution, and how many years you have to retire. That's all you need. Just these four facts, which should be at your fingertips or at some statement that you get from your company. And then you put them into a little funnel, mix them up, and out will come a retirement projection. And that will tell you whether or not you need to adjust anything. Okay, so that's the concept. How does it work in real life? Where well, there's this thing called a retirement readiness calculator. You can find this on the website, lifetimedreamguide.com. Just scroll down, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. Just scroll down, and you will be able to find that and use what I'm about to show you. So what does this look like? Well, you see what this calculator looks like. It looks like a real calculator. And all you do is you're going to put those numbers into the calculator. You put your, your salary information in there and your contribution information in there and your savings information and then you you could put in this extra post retirement projections if you know your social security or any pensions or any other outside income you could put those in there too and then you press calculate and what happens is it returns your goal oriented target now remember this goal oriented target is what you need when you take out a loan. So if your goal-oriented target is 5.79%, that means that you need to earn at least 5.79% annually on your investments in order to retire in comfort. If you have a loan, you have to pay back 5.79% in order to make sure that that loan doesn't hurt your chances for retirement. Now let's go back to the, uh, the website here. We'll actually go on the website. Here's the website. And you can, and I'll put again the little thing that says what it is. So you go there at lifetimedreamguide.com. Okay, you just scroll down from this website here. You'll see what looks like a calculator. You just click that, and in a few seconds, it'll pop up on your screen. And then just go to gross annual salary, put in what your salary is. Let's say that you are earning $80,000 a year. See, there's room you could put your spouse money in there too. And let's say you've saved $150,000 and you're contributing $10,000 a year because your company's matching. So that includes your company match. And we'll say you have 25 years to retirement. Just press to calculate. We'll, we'll skip this part with social security and pensions. And you'll see you got you need 5.9. Now let's say that you do get Social Security, and let's say it's $15,000 a year. Press calculate, and now that's down to 4.62%. So you see how adding these other things will drive your goal when you target down lower. And that's all there is to it. So now you can try it at home for yourself. So there you go. That's what drives you to retirement success. And it hopefully is something that. You will have learned and everybody here will be able to go and have some success in retirement. If you want to learn more about this, definitely go ahead and buy the book, Hey, What's My Number? How to Increase the Odds You'll Retire in Comfort, subtitle. And it really gives you more of a how-to on this entire thing. So that's it for this week. If you want to be a member of the live audience where you can ask questions like we saw today, just go to stateof.greaterwesternnewyork.com and you can sign up and it will allow you to receive the email every Thursday in the morning that will give you
you the link so you can be on the live audience at noon on Thursdays. Now, I realize noon time during workday, you're working, you might not be able to see this. So don't worry, you can always go to stateofgreaterworcester.com and check out our archives. This one will be under business because financial. So that's all we have for this week. Uh, again, thank you very much. And we'll see you all next week with some interesting history that we've got lined up. That's it for now. Bye-bye.